Okay. We are set. This probably isn't though. All right. Wow. It's always setting up this tripod. That's probably one of the most frustrating things, I guess. Not sure if that's the best way to call it. But um, let me see if I can make this good. Ooh, yes. There's an alarm. Don't know from where, but something going on outside. Uh, I should probably open up the stream over here as well. Um, on the computer so I can respond to any comments, but I also don't want to hear myself twice. <laughs> All right, good. Not centered. Let me see if I can center this a little bit better. Uh, it's always, I swear, it's this tripod. All right, good afternoon, or <laughs> I guess the Spanish way, buenas. Um, how is everyone doing? Uh, we are going to begin. Um, start everything as soon as possible uh, because I want to optimize time since um, I've seen the concerns that some of these live streams go on for too long. Um, I don't try to make them go on too long. It's just sometimes there's just a lot to talk about. And uh, I'd rather talk about it all and not leave anything behind. But anyways, uh, it's these like, I guess these side rants that kind of make it go on too long as well. So try to avoid that. Uh, today we have a few focuses, as I mentioned before. I also took a lot of notes, more than I was hoping. Um, just because there's a lot to talk about. Jay, how's it going? Buenas. Uh, we got things to talk about. Since it's early, we also have good sunlight. Uh, the light from my room plus the sunlight outside, good lighting. Also, as you can see, for those who were part of the last live stream, I also have my glasses now. And if you saw my last video also, you might have seen them. Robert, buenas. Como estas? <laughs> um, let everyone join. In the meantime, this is a little bit of a, I guess you could say, intermediate period. Um, but I'd like to, uh, first let's see if we can talk about a little bit uh, what the structure of the stream is going to be like. Oh, Tallahassee. How are things like over there? Are they sunny? <laughs> uh, over here we got a lot of sun. Todo bien aquí en Austin, Texas. Excelente. Excellent. Um, over here, we've had a lot of sun these last few days. And um, there was like, I think, one day that rained. But anyways, I keep going <laughs> off track. Basically, uh, oh, Robert also. There's two Robert Jackson. Robert Jackson from Tallahassee and Robert Stewart from Austin, Texas. Robert and Robert. Here they say that when you have the same name as someone, uh, they call you Tokayo. Um, the word is uh, Tokayo. That's basically when two people have the same name. So uh, Robert and Robert, you guys are Tokayos. Dos Roberts. Or like they say here, they sometimes say uh, Robert, like the name of the person, times two, or that thing times two, por dos, eh, por dos. I'm going to write that in the chat, too. Eh, Luis, hello. Oh, it's raining in Cuenca. Didn't expect that. But good to see you here, Luis. Uh, we got a lot of things to talk about. I keep wanting to talk about the structure, and I keep the sidetrack. But I'm, I'm glad everyone's interacting. Uh, I'm glad you've made it. Um, today, we have a few different talking points. Uh, like I had said before, we're going to talk about the results of Muerte Cruzada, not just in the official sense, but also from the sense that, like, the way that people uh, have taken this whole situation. Um, some of the decrees that have been approved, uh, the energy crisis that we're probably, I mean, probably, maybe, not sure, we might go through. It's not guaranteed. Um, also, presidential candidates. Uh, I'd also like to uh, answer some member questions, and I'm also going to shout out the members in a second because the members help make this uh, 
this dream of mine like a reality, help make this possible. So it's like, it's, uh, it's always appreciated. Everyone who's here, of course, I appreciate you for being here. Uh, if you can share this stream with people who need to see it or leave a like and a comment, interact, that's all gonna help. Um, but yeah, we got a few things to talk about. Uh, Robert Jackson, where are you now? If you're, talking, if you're asking me, uh, I'm currently in Puerto Viejo. Uh, this is, it, whenever you see me here uh, with this background, this is my room, this is my, this is my house. Um, well, not my house, it's the room that I have in this house. Um, and uh, this is where I'm live streaming today. Nice and sunny, uh, so we got good lighting for now. Um, let's see here, Asesol in New Jersey. Hello, Michael. Uh, espero que estés bien. <laughs> I hope you're good um, and that the sun isn't too unbearable. I actually had to turn on the air because I know once I start to talk and once I get, I get into all this, it gets, it gets hot. Um, Kim, buenas. Uh, buenas noches. It's uh, nighttime uh, over here. Uh, I guess buenas noches to you as well. Good evening. Um, although over here, we're still in the, in the afternoon, pretty early. Um, I decided to start early mainly because of the light and to try to get everything done as quickly as possible so everyone can go do what they got to do. Uh, as usual, I've got my water, but now we've got a straw that my dad gave me um, mm -hmm. to drink, the water with lemon with salt. And uh, yeah, so first, uh, let me do a really quick uh, shout out to um, the channel members and I'd like to start off by answering uh, some of their questions um, because I did make a post in the community tab for channel members and uh, I asked if there was anything they wanted me to answer specifically. Uh, so starting off there, uh, the channel members, Daniel Johnson, uh, Mark Horning and Lisa, I'm not sure if it would be Thais or Thais. Uh, I really appreciate your support uh, for being a YouTube channel member. It means a lot to me. It helps me out in this process. Um, I'd also like to shout out the Buy Me A Coffee members, one who's actually in the chat, Mr. J. Thank you very much uh, for your continued support. Uh, Ray, a good friend of mine who supports the channel as well. We've also got a little picture, portrait of him back there. Uh, William. Brian and Candice, thank you very much, you guys, for your support. Um, so let's get into it. Let's, let's start, uh, we're going to start with the questions, ideally, because, uh, like I said, I do want to honor their commitment and support. I apologize to those in Buy Me A Coffee who, if I didn't ask the same question there. It kind of slipped my mind, and not on purpose, honestly. Uh, I should have known to do it, but uh, yeah. Robert. Thank you so much for the dono. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for helping me out in this process. If you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and ask because uh, I'm here to answer. I'm here to help. Um, and uh, thanks for going above and beyond, like for real. Uh, okay, the, the questions, the questions. I, I keep getting off I keep, I, ah, my brain. Um, so uh, one of the questions that I got, and I'm going to go directly to the question because I want it to be as accurate and precise as possible. Uh, one of the questions was from Daniel, uh, Daniel Johnson, who is, I think was uh, one of the first channel members, uh, YouTube channel members. Um, his comment was, uh, Ola, I was watching Amelia and JP's channel. Uh, JP had mentioned that many politicians may not run because they would be saving their campaign funds for the next term in 2025. If this does happen and they do not get enough politicians to fill all the vacancies, assembly and president, what happens? Will the vacancies remain vacant? So there's a lot of terminology that's really like, like, uh, I guess you could say intricate when it comes to politics, I think in general, not just in, in Spanish, but in English as well. But I tried to make sense of it and try to like compress it down into something that I felt was more understandable uh, when I talked about the subject because I had to ask around in order to be sure and investigate. And the best way that I understand it, the best way that I can um, interpret it is the fact that if 
there's a political campaign, for example, I can actually use an example. We have a Creo, which is the campaign, um, one of the political parties, I guess you would say, and um, they're not going to participate. And really, nothing happens in, the, in light of them not participating. It's like if there were 10 presidential candidates, now there's nine. And um, there's no real, I guess you would say, legal consequence to it. Like, as you would expect, there's like nothing that's going to happen, I guess, uh, to the person, but, or to the campaign, to the party. But what is, I guess you would say, a consequence of this is uh, in the future, because if they do decide to run, which they probably will, they decide to run in 2025, uh, later on, they're going to have a complication. They're going to, it's going to be complicated for them uh, to run in the sense that they, 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 they didn't participate here, so they lose presence. Like, if people don't see you participating, it's like you become less existent in their minds. Like, oh, they didn't participate, so uh, they don't have any new projects. They, like, of course, these are just like my speculations, but the reality is that people, you could say, like, lose interest in them or they just don't take them as seriously because they just don't have a presence in the current election. You could even see it as kind of, I guess, from the perspective of a person who takes interest in these things, kind of cowardly because... There's a general consensus that this political campaign, it's like a transition period. This, the one that's going to come up now because of the Muerte Cruzada. It's not like, it's not the full four year presidency. It's just like a year and a half. And because of that, not participating makes you look, I guess you could say weak, cowardly. Like, oh, you don't want to participate because you know you, you can't do anything in that short amount of time. But that also means you don't want to try. Positively, you can see it as, oh, they don't want to mess anything up with the short amount of time they have. Like if I were to run, suppose, imagine if I were running um, and I weren't able to do anything, what would everyone say? What would the people in general say? Oh, Ace is useless. Ace doesn't know what he's doing. Ace doesn't do anything, uh, even though he's the president. Like, it, it's just, a, it's a bad look. Uh, if I were to win and nothing were to happen and it's a bad look for not participating because it's like Oh, I bet you ace would have done something, but he just didn't want to try He he didn't put in the effort or his campaign his party So it's just it's mainly an aspect kind of thing like how you take it uh, When you look at the campaign at the party for not participating But consequence none really there's no like oh you're in trouble for not participating it's just, there's one less person participating. And uh, yeah, Roddy, hola. <laughs> I don't know if you're still here. No sé si sigues aquí, but yes, tomorrow. Uh, Roddy's telling me about the training that we have um, tomorrow. Um, football training. I don't know if you, if everyone here, if you tuned into the live stream or if you saw the replay of our football game against uh, Santo Domingo. Uh, it was cool. Um, but if uh, you haven't checked it out, that's okay. My channel's purpose isn't American football uh, in Ecuador, but um, if there's enough interest for it, then I will continue to cover it, uh, at least the games that we have. Uh, that reminds me, I will, uh, I'll talk about that later, actually, you know. I want to continue with the, with the questions. Uh, so that was uh, resolving Daniel's doubt. Um, I hope that gave a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, information and insight into that part of the situation and hopefully I responded that doubt. Uh, moving on, there was another question from channel member uh, Lisa. So, uh, hello GMAs, this is the comment. Some things I've been wondering about are, I heard a rumor that Cuenca's airport was going to be closing down to rebuild the runway. Have you heard this and do you have any idea when that's going to be happening? I was trying to plan a trip to Ecuador in November, and that's a key flight for me back to Quito. I'd like to know how Ecuadorians are doing. Oh, and this is the second question, because there's two parts. The second question, uh, I'd like to know uh, how the Ecuadorians are doing with the political environment right now. And I believe in your last live stream, you mentioned something about a candidate who runs often but never wins. And he is thought of as the people's candidate. 
I'd love to know more about that person and what his platform is. Okay, so Lisa, I see you've just, uh, you've come out, you're here in the live stream. Hello, Lisa. Good afternoon. Buenas. Uh, yay, the glasses look great. Popping in and out, expecting some people, but we'll catch up. Cool. Uh, hopefully, uh, you get to listen to this part, and if not, in the replay, you can check it out. But uh, I'm here, I'm going to answer your question. So, um, first, the first question, probably the most, uh, the one that I can give the most insight into. Uh, well, first, uh, Don Shader, what's going on, my man, brother? Glad to see you here. And yeah, the glasses, they came out good. I actually went with a friend, so uh, he, he recommended a good place for me. And um, they actually, like, they had these cool glasses. They had a lot of different glasses, and these were the ones that I liked the most. And uh, yeah, I'm glad they came out good. So I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone who supported me on that. Uh, let me answer this question for Lisa. Uh, thanks, brother. Uh, so let me answer this question. Basically, first, with the situation of the airport um, closing down, yes, the rumors are true. The only problem is that there's no specific date. Uh, I, I'd like to shout out really quick at Buildev Tours. Um, he is a fellow YouTuber. He talks about Cuenca specifically, and he gives tours in Cuenca. Um, Jay, Jay Jensen, actually, he knows uh, about Bildev. He was actually the person who introduced me in the sense that he showed me the channel, and I was like, oh, cool. Um, and Mr. Lewis, he, uh, he told me. I asked Lewis, like, hey, what's the situation? And he told me, yes, the airport is going to be closing, but the problem with uh, the specifics is that there are no specifics. It's just supposed to close for three months, but it's not confirmed when the three months are. The only thing that is uh, specifically known, at least uh, from what I got from, from Mr. Lewis, uh, Bildev Tours, is that um, it won't be during the summer season. Basically, June, July, and August should, in theory, be safe because that would be grave for the tourism sector because that is the highest season. So basically, expect the airport in Cuenca to close down sometime after that because we're in the summer season right now. So if it closes, it's gotta be after these months. So up until August, that's when it might close. Uh, also, let me say hi. Uh, let me see what Robert had to say. Uh, glad to see you here. <laughs> uh, Robert and Don. Uh, let me see, Berg, uh, sup base, what's going on? How's it going? Buenas, we're doing the, the, the Spanish hi, buenas always to everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, and let me go on into the second question of Lisa, uh, which was um, about the people's candidate. See, the thing is, my interpretation of how the people took him was apparently not the best. I thought there, there's a positive light on, on Alvaro Novoa in the sense that you could, well, positive from the people because he interacts with the people. He's like, he does things that that would make anyone who's, who's into social media look at him in a positive light. But that's the thing, and that's what I'm understanding a little bit more in terms of politics. Being seen like in a good light by social media doesn't mean being seen in a good light in the political sense. So basically what I have to say about that is that um, there's affection towards Alvaro as a public figure because he is one of the richest people in the country, from what I, I gathered in the information. But he can't be taken seriously politically because all he does is, um, at least not in his campaigns, but like in general, is upload videos of, um, of funny things. And that's why people see him with affection, but politics sees him, unfortunately, as a clown. I don't know exactly what he supports or what he stands for, and most people I guess they mix both parts uh, of him being like online on social media and him trying to be in politics. So they see it as not a good thing. And the people like, like if I, I, if I just see him on social media, I think he's a, he, he seems like a really nice guy. He seems really good, but he doesn't seem to be the ideal person in political sense, at least from what, what I've gathered. 
But I will say that his son is actually participating. And I'll be talking about that right now when I talk about the presiden presidential candidates. Uh, and okay, what is his name? His name is uh, Alvaro Noboa, also known as Alvarito, as people know him with affection as Alvarito. So um, this is him. Like I said, once again, one of the richest people in the country. Um, due to his dad, I think, being the owner of the Paseo Shopping or one of the owners. And um, that is who he is. So no problem, Lisa. Thank you for being here. And um, if you have things to do, please join back. Come in and out on the stream. We're going to be here uh, as long as we need to be. Because that was, the, <laughs> that was the overall consensus. We need the stream to be as long as it needs to be. Cool. But I'm not going to try to make it longer than it needs to be. So um, you guys know I'm trying to split this into parts. So that was the answers to the members' questions. Uh, once again, I appreciate the members for their support. Uh, I'd also like to appreciate, again, Robert for the donation. Honestly, everything helps because um, I'm trying to make this a 100% all-time thing so I can dedicate myself to making content. And also, uh, as a side thing, like giving tours, ironically, because um, I actually gave a tour recently, but we'll talk about that later on. Uh, Louis, no, thank you very much for being here. We uh, appreciate your comment and helping us out with this information helping out Lisa because Lisa is, uh, is a channel member and, and even if she weren't, she's a part of the community and I always want to help. If there's any way I can ever help anyone who's on here, send me a question, send me an email. Um, obviously, I'll try to give preference to members because of the support, but I'm never, gonna not, I'm never not going to try to answer a question. I'm always going to try to do my best to give you the best answer, which is why I've been kind of slow to answer comments, but we'll talk about that later on when I talk about personal things. Uh, awesome, Lisa. Go ahead, do what you got to do, and catch up when you got the time. Um, let's continue with uh, the results of La Muerte Cruzada, or the mutual death, as we have uh, decided to, to call it, since it seems most appropriate. Um, oh, also, I'll leave a link to Mr. Lewis's channel, if I can find the, uh, the link. Um, actually, yeah, just directly. I can just copy and paste. I keep forgetting not everything is a share button. So um, this is uh, Mr. Lewis's channel, Build of Tours. If you ever need information about Cuenca um, or even a tour, you can uh, talk to him. Um, we'll talk about more that a little bit later on as well. So let's continue with uh, the results of La Muerte Cruzada. So, uh, okay. The thing is, uh, first, I guess the, 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 the people's opinion on it, I guess we'll start off with that, um, at least from what we've been able to see, is that uh, the first thing, I guess the positive thing, is that seemingly useless, and this referring to the people who are working in Congress, have been thrown out. They are not working there anymore. We already knew what the result of Fuente Cruzada was in that sense that the people who are working in Congress have been kicked out. There's no more Congress, and now the decisions are taken by the president, which is Guillermo Lasso, and congressional court. That was the first result. And one thing that is happening with these people is that they're looking for ways to be reelected. Because in theory, they're not being allowed to run again, like to be a congressman, but they're trying to find a way. And, um, you know, they, they'll, they'll find a way. And it's not really convenient, in my mind, for them to run anyways. I know they want the money, and that's why they'll try. But um, it's not convenient because even if they, if they were to ally with any political party, then that party, I'm pretty sure the popularity is going to plummet. If, and this is another speculative thing uh, about the, the Ecuadorian people, like the population if the population pays attention to what happened in the past. Because the reality is, when someone is elected into power, and this can be in any country, you know that the person electing it is the people. That person, the person electing that person, uh, the person electing that person, is the people. So if, if we choose to have the same person who did nothing for us in a period of, let's say, the four years that a president has, 
then the fault is on us for choosing that same person. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a problem that we are causing on ourselves. So that's the situation right now. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, let me see here. Ah, uh, the second thing that has been a result of Muerte Cruzada is that some of the decrees that President Lasso has uh, put into effect, has wanted to enact, have actually gone through, while others have not. We'll talk about those in a second. And uh, the last thing really is, uh, I guess, I don't know if you want to see it as sad or as good, is basically that life just goes on. Um, if I had to tell you from a personal perspective how Muerte Cruzada has affected me as a person, like Ace as a person living in Ecuador, I honestly haven't seen it. I don't see people talking about it. I don't see people worried about it anymore. Like the, the rush, the hype, the, the, the worries, the concerns were the first three days maybe, like maximum three days. But after that, you just don't see people talking about it unless you go on to the news and, and listen to the an analysis from uh, people who analyze these situations. My dad checks that out a lot more than I do. He hears about it more because of the people he knows. But other than that, it's honestly, it's just been like nothing. So was Muerte Cruzada a good thing in my opinion? I mean, getting rid of people who are just taking money from, from the people yeah, I think it's a good thing. Um, so it's it, but it has it affected me personally, Ace? No, not really. Um, has it affected Ecuadorians? I don't really think so. Uh, unless they were family with these people who got kicked out, then yeah, of course their lifestyle is going to change completely because things are going to get harder for them. Supposedly, the the Congress and the people who are complaining about their three thousand five hundred dollar salaries are out looking for jobs, looking for a way to, you know, to, to pay their debts. But um, it's hard to have sympathy when, you know, they were kind of robbing the country and not doing anything. So I don't want to get too into which side I'm on, but as you can probably notice, like, I don't really like the fact that we had people there who were doing nothing. But anyways. Uh, talking about the decrees that were approved, obviously the Muerte Cruzada is the main one, but it's important to, to mention again, mainly because of the fact that there was a chance, as with any decree or anything that uh, you enact, that it could have been declined. And it was actually a curiosity of mine as to why, if Congress has so much power and they manipulate the Congressional Court from time to time, why couldn't they stop Muerte Cruzada from happening? And the explanation to this was the fact that the Muerte Cruzada was enacted and it was so well, like, proposed. Like, there was no way for anyone to, like, to talk about it. Like, for anyone to say, no, you can't do this. Like, typically when you deny a decree or you deny something that is being asked of, of you know, the government, like the government tries to enact something, if you want to deny it, you have to have strong claims behind it, like strong evidence as to why this isn't a good thing. But Muerte Cruzada was put out and there was nothing against it, nothing that could stop it from happening. So that's why it actually went through. Um, Lewis, economy is on a standby status. Investors are waiting to see what happens with the election. So meanwhile, we are stable. Yeah. I consider this kind of like the eye of the storm or the calm before the storm. I guess before the actual hurricane or tornado were to hit. I use the hurricane example because I'm just so used to Florida. But, um, but yeah, at any moment, um, the economy is going to take a hit. It already has. Uh, something we're going to talk about later about how the price of certain things has gone up. But if you've seen live streams with me before, then you probably already heard that we we s suffer uh, price increases, gradual price increases, like at every moment. You might not notice it because it's so small, but we'll talk about that later on. So the second decree that was uh, approved uh, was a security decree, um, which allows the military to work with the police to help protect the citizens. Um, so basically, one of the things that came into effect as a positive thing with that is that now the people who were vacunadores, 
the people who are doing the whole vaccine thing, I'm not sure if you would call them vaccinists or just people who are, you know, vaccining uh, the population, uh, they are now considered a terrorist. The same thing with kidnappers and other people who commit really heinous crimes. They're not looked at just normal criminals because as we've talked about before, normal criminals here in Ecuador are kind of treated in a way that's just too fair for them and not fair for the crimes that they commit. And now, since the military is working with the police and with this security decree, now they're considered terrorists. And terrorists is just another level of criminal. So a higher level, which means that they're not going to get out as easily as before. Of course, as with any decree, as with anything that happens in the country, there's always a way to kind of, not sure if it would be circumvent, but basically, you know, skirt around the rules. But um, at least for now, it kind of gives people the idea that, okay, these people are going to be taken a little bit more uh, seriously than they were before. Not just they're criminals, but they're extreme criminals, which is something that I feel they should have been categorized as, as you know, way before. But uh, yeah, that is the uh, second decree. Um, Mr. Daniel, hello. Uh, was supposed to notify me, but never got the notice. It's all right, Daniel. Uh, good to see you here. Uh, a little bit late. I, I, uh, when you get to see the replay, I actually answered your question uh, earlier on. I decided to make it like a member's um, answering the member's questions. Um, but I will touch up a little bit more on the whole situation of the, of the campaign a little bit further on, because we do need to talk about the candidates just a little bit. The little bit that I know, of course. Um, okay, so there is a, another, not sure if I would call it a decree, but they're supposed to be reduced taxes uh, for some people, uh, specifically those who declare taxes, uh, basically from working common jobs. So apparently the government is going to give back some of these people and I, I'm included in that, ironically, um, a certain amount of money, apparently $108, uh, for people who declare taxes and who, who have the right to get um, the tax refund. Um, so, you know, that's a, a positive for the people who are uh, paying taxes and declaring these taxes. Um, it's still on a let's see basis because when it comes to money, it's kind of iffy. Like with the, let me just put as an example when there's the campaign period. Uh, whenever there's the campaign period, there's um, obviously people who are at table. And when they're at table, like they have to, how do you say this? They, they, they get paid for that. Like if I were to be, if I were to be called upon to be one of the people at table, uh, making sure that everyone is like voting and giving them the papers and the instructions. Uh, I'm supposed to get paid for that. Apparently, I think they get the people who do that, they get paid $20 and it's not voluntary. You have to do it um, because the government like says, oh, it's your turn. You have to be at table. So, oh, oh boy, no one likes it. Um, and the worst part is that the fine for not doing it, I think is like double what they pay you. And they really, they're really demanding with it. Um, but when it comes to paying the people, some people say they don't get paid until various months after the election. So it's kind of like they did the work, they spent the day there, but they get paid, woo, who knows when. <laughs> so it's kind of a pain. Uh, Michelle, hello, uh, digging a new, I'm guessing the glasses. Thank you very much. Uh, this is all thanks to everyone who was able to uh, uh, donate to help me get these glasses. And uh, I will always be grateful. I, I always look at these glasses and I'm like, this is the community. This is the community uh, showing the support that sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to do things by myself and I appreciate it. Um, but as I was talking, as I was saying um, about the decrees, uh, there are some pending decrees as well. Bit of a frustrating situation because um, we'll go into why it's frustrating in a bit. But first, uh, there's two decrees. Uh, there's one that's pending, but not because of 
the country. So basically, there's a decree that's pending on the reduction of taxes on trades with China. Um, it's called eh, Tratado de Libre Comercio, uh, the Treaty of Free Commerce, I guess you could say. Uh, the legislative authorities need to approve it because the countries already have it approved. And the theory behind why it's not going through, at least this decree specifically, is because Congress, not Congress, the Congressional Court doesn't want to let it go through. But the reason why Congressional Court doesn't want to let it go through, even though it might be a positive for the country, is because, I guess you could say, congressmen or ex-congressmen who already have the money that they took from when they were in Congress, they're kind of paying off Congressional Court. Is this the case? I can't confirm this. This is just what's circulating around and the concerns of the people. So it's kind of uh, annoying because I assume having free commerce or reduced taxes with, with China would be a positive for, for Ecuador, of course. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything behind the scenes that kind of affects Ecuador in a negative way, but from what I can imagine, at least in my mind, and I might be wrong, is that it sounds like a good thing, that Congre Congressional Court is not letting go through. Um, there's also another uh, reduction of taxes that is being held back, but not by court this time, not by the Congressional Court, but by the country itself. So basically, um, there is a, oh, two of them actually. There's one with Mexico that apparently Mexico wants some modifications in the treaty. And the same thing with the United States. There's two treaties that they want, with, one with each country that wants to be made. Ecuador wants it, but the countries themselves uh, want some modifications in the, in the treaty in order for it to go through. So those are the situations with the decrees. I don't know if uh, anyone has any doubts that I could answer because that's the information I have and um, about these things, but not sure if there's anything that's missing there. Any gaps in information that you'd like to know about, either way, uh, feel free to ask. Um, but in the meantime, I say we continue with the next topics, um, going on a little bit into the the candidates of the elections. And um, I can't say really that I understand the whole situation with the elections to 100% degree, but um, I do know about the people who, some of the people who are participating um, and some of the conflicts in the situation with, the, with this election in particular. Going into that, basically what I said before, earlier when we talked about the whole transitional period of the elections, people aren't looking at this as a full-blown election cycle because it isn't. It's literally about two to three months of preparation to an election that is only going to la that's going to have a presidency that's only going to last about a year and a half. So you could say that the motivation isn't as high. But there is one super solid motivation for those who are running for president right now, which is basically the fact that if you're running for president right now, and if you win, and if you keep things solid, you do things well, everything works out great, then you will probably have a better chance of being reelected in the actual 2025 big four-year term elections. On the contrary, if you bust, if you fail, there's the positive that you could excuse it on the short amount of time that you had to do, to be in office, to, to, to be a president, to do your job as a president. So there's a positive that comes tied in with a negative, and it really depends on the interpretation of the people. Because like I said, I could look at it as this person had a year and a half and they didn't have enough time to do anything. But someone else could look at it like, oh, this person had a year and a half and they didn't do anything. So it really depends on perspective and also on the Congress that follows with this situation, with this election. Because once again, if, you're, if, if you have the same situation as Lasso had, Lasso had the problem with Congress apparently limiting his, uh, his decision making. 
if the next president that comes in for this one and a half year term also has Congress going against him, then what's going to happen is the same thing as before. Nothing is going to change and things might actually get worse. Because unfortunately, when I say nothing changes, from the outside, from the perspective of a person living their life, just doing things as they have to do, nothing really changes. But in a general sense, things do change. The economy, like I've said before, things get more expensive. Not sure if that would be the fault of the president, but who else are people going to blame? That's just where all the blame goes. Uh, the situation with crime, if nothing gets better, then at least we hope it doesn't get worse. But as we've noticed, as I think some people have taken notice, uh, and we'll talk about that later on, crime is gradually increasing. It's not a, I go outside right now and I'm going to get robbed kind of increase, but it's an increase that you know it's happening because if it weren't happening, no one would complain about it. Um, but anyways, so there's a few presidential candidates and actually uh, Bildev Tor recently told me that there's also uh, two other candidates who, who have now come into light. Well, not two candidates, basically the political campaign of Rafael Correa, El Correismo as they call it. Uh, they have their candidates now, which are Luisa Gonzalez and Andres Arauz. Anyone who uh, remembers Arauz, this was the person who was supposedly going to try to change the dollar into something else. But this time, this person is running as vice president and not as president. Um, so they represent the Correismo, as people call it. Um, then there's also the presidential candidate, like I mentioned earlier when talking about, when answering Lisa's question, uh, Noboa. And this isn't uh, Alvarito. This is Alvarito's son. Uh, I think his name was Daniel Novoa. Um, and the positive thing about uh, Mr. Novoa, which I can uh, say, is that people have him as like a fresh option in the sense that he's not campaigning with anyone who's, who was in the previous Congress. So people are looking at that as a positive sign. It doesn't guarantee anything, of course, because behind the scenes, who knows what's happening. But for people who are tired of seeing the same people who are messing, messing things up in the country, that's the positive light that they spin on this presidential candidate. Um, there's also the, um, this other person whose last name is Topic. Um, in Spanish, I guess you would just pronounce it Topic. And this is... This person is a popular candidate basically because they're vying for security. This person is trying to make things safer in Ecuador. And how do they guarantee it? Basically, this person was an ex-military, like apparently worked outside of the country with, um, with the military. I don't remember exactly in what sector, what sector Navy or um, the general uh, army, but people seem to really like this person based on that, the promise of security that they're making. Um, what they don't like, what kind of conflicts, is that his political party or his political campaign, well, I would say the party, I'm guessing party and campaign, different terms. That's the confusing part of all this. But um, the people who back um, Topic, um, they're sending out a candidate as part of his, his party um, who is from the, um, the Correismo, basically. So it's, it's kind of weird for people to see this party with this representative, this possible president, and him sending out a candidate, like him working with someone from the Correismo, from the Revolución Ciudadana, because they don't match. They're not the same thing. I don't understand it completely. I actually want to make a whole video understanding all the political parties at a later date when I can get the full information and understand it as well as I can. But for now, it's just, it doesn't seem like, um, I can't say he's the worst choice, 
but he can't be the best choice if his political, if the party that's backing him up is also using someone who's not part of their party and who has nothing to do with their party. Uh, like Mr. Lewis says, he was part of the Foreign Legion in several wars. So there's, there's hope because of that. Uh, and then there's another person, uh, Otto. I don't know his last name because it's kind of hard to pronounce. Um, but the, he's participating, but I'm not sure who is exactly backing him as a party. So that's the situation with the campaign. Um, from what I can see, which side or who do people trust? I don't really, I can't really say exactly who people trust, but people are obviously going for the side of security. They're going to want to go with topic. For people who want to see different people in Congress, they're going to want to go for Novoa. And then, of course, for people who really, really love Correismo, they're going to want to go for the people who have now joined the Correismo party. More thoughts on that at a later date from maybe from Lewis, who might talk about it later on. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail just because it's kind of hard to talk about in the sense that I don't really know. If, if I were to talk about it from the perspective of just Ace, like not looking at the perspective of anyone else or anything else, I just don't know who to trust. And this is kind of, I guess you could say, the general consensus of everyone. How do I trust people who are sending out candidates with a Congress that is very similar to the Congress from before? The same people who did nothing, joining Congress just equals into, they're probably not going to do anything again. So why would I, like, how could I, like, trust these people? But yeah. That's the, the situation. Those are my thoughts, my initial thoughts on this situation. Um, I, I can't even say who I would choose for. Like, if I were to choose, I'd also want either Topic or Noboa, just because, like I said, Topic has safety, security things going for him, and Noboa seems to be the, the option that has new people. But that's about it. Who, do, who are they as people? Are they trustworthy? Will they really do what they promised they're going to do? Who knows? Um, but yeah, that's the situation with uh, the campaigns. Uh, up till now, uh, I'd like to ask the public, are there any questions about um, the decrees, the Muerte Cruzada, uh, the situation with Mr. Um, well, not just Mr., the guys who are participating for the, uh, for the presidency? Uh, if you have any questions, of course, please ask now. I'll take this little mini intermission to drink some water. <laughs> um, okay, so um, if there are no uh, immediate questions, either way there will be a moment for general Q&A later on. Um, let's continue with the situation of the energy crisis. Um, something that I ended up finding out about by talking to my dad who had actually heard about it um, on the news. Uh, Correismo. Uh, the Correismo party is just basically the party that Everyone just says they're the people who are fans of Rafael Correa and they pretty much just continue the line of the things that Rafael Correa did. So that is the party that's generally called the Correismo party. Uh, specifically, uh, the party is called the Revolución, Revolución Ciudadana. And I can't go into too much details as to who they are, what they do, just because, once again, I'd like to make a dedicated video on that. Once I have the information of every political party, their pluses, the good things that they've done as um, political parties, and the minuses, the bad things, the negatives, the bad things that they've done, because we have to highlight everything if we're going to talk about a whole situation about that. But like I said, a video for a later date. Um, I'm just hoping I get the chance to talk about it correctly because, as you know, I like to investigate a lot when it comes to these things. And um, unless I've investigated completely, I'm not going to talk about that. This I've investigated as much as I can, and that's why I'm talking about it now. Uh, but I realize there's still a lot more information to get to. Just for example, this morning I was able to, po to finally post because I got it, the information late. But the good thing, not good, but... I got more information about it, the situation with Esmeraldas. It's not good what happened, 
but I was able to get it out there. And recently, like I think it was yesterday itself, was when more information came out. And, um, you know, I was able to get it out there uh, late, but I didn't want it. Like when I got the information, like you saw, now there's more information about it. And now it's more complete. The roads uh, to Esmeralda, they're in a, in a road emergency. So it's probably going to be very difficult getting around Esmeraldas if you or anyone who's here um, plans on visiting. But uh, yeah, uh, Daniel, no problem. My curiosity is due to the fact my plans are to move by mid to late 2024. Cool, man. No worries then. Um, be prepared because things are going to, you know, things are probably going to start escalating as soon as the election campaign cycle, uh, the actual elections begin. Just hoping whoever gets into power is someone who does something in the short time that they have because it'll give people hope. And um, I think we always want to have hope. We, we have fear here. Like, I, I speak for the majority when I say that there's fear, there's concerns. We don't want to keep living through the same situation, but we also don't do anything to change it. That's uh, something that I talked about with my dad, going on a more personal, I guess, our thoughts level. And it's the fact that, once again, we choose the presidents. So if we're choosing these people who have already done terrible things in the country, then whose fault is it but our own? Basically, we're just, we're putting ourselves in the same hole and it, it's just, it's not good. It's, it's us digging our own graves, if you will. I mean, it's not that bad, but it's basically us, us choosing the bad stuff for ourselves. So yeah, um, sounds wild. There's a saying that anyone who wants to be a p politician shouldn't be. Uh, Jonah and Loha recommends a book called The Open Veins of Latin America. I have learned a lot from that book. I should probably read that book too, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of things I probably, it, I don't want to get too much into politics. I like discussing the, the I like kind of breaking it down so everyone understands it in a simpler light because that's what I like to do. I like to facilitate information, but I'm not going to call myself an expert on Ecuadorian politics because I am not. Um, I can give the information that I've heard, that I've investigated and um, translated because a lot of the information is unfortunately in Spanish. But I can't tell you that this is 100% um, the best thing because I can't say I know what's best uh, for Ecuador because there's probably a lot of things, even if I were to say what's best for Ecuador, there's probably a lot of work that goes behind making that a reality. And it's a lot more than just me saying, you need to do this. There's probably a whole process for that to happen. But yeah, um, moving on. Let's talk about the energy crisis. Um, so, we know uh, currently there's this situation with uh, El Nino and uh, La Nina, the whole situation with, with that going on. And uh, apparently something that I've come to learn, like I said, talking with my dad, is that we apparently have been getting energy, electricity from Colombia. So what does that mean? After November, it is possible that the energy in Ecuador is going to have to be rationed. Why? Because currently Colombia, since they've been providing us the energy, you know, we've, we've been able to make up for missing energy. But what's going to happen is that because of La Nina that Colombia is going to be going through, they're not going to have water and the water that they, that they need is what powers their, their hydroelectric, hydroelectric power plants. So if they're not producing power and they're the ones who are giving us power to make up for the power that we don't have, the electricity, we're not going to have power once Colombia doesn't have it either. Unless we get it from somewhere else, of course. But there's that possibility that we're going to have to ration our energy here in Ecuador after November. So that's the possible energy crisis that Ecuador is going to possibly go through um, in the coming months because we're, 
we're not close to November, but we're not necessarily far from it either. But yeah, um, I'm just hoping from, you know, obviously personal perspective that it doesn't get too bad. Just to give you on a, on a more local level, we just last week we had a crisis with water in Puerto Viejo. And that was because some transformers in the, um, in the water plant of, um, I think it was, I want to say it was Rio Chico. They were, they got, um, they, they were broken, they were busted. So they had to get replaced. So Puerto Viejo was left without water for like a week. People weren't happy about it. And um, this is going a little bit into personal stuff, but um, people weren't happy about it because the problem took way too long to resolve. And leaving people without water for that long, it really made them question the leadership, the, uh, the mayorcy, the mayorship of um, our current mayor, uh, Mr. Pinkai. But um, it just goes to show how important these things are. Electricity, uh, water, obviously to anyone. Just look at how Esmeralda's right now. They have too much water and now they're in a bad situation, which once again, uh, my thoughts go out to the people living in Esmeralda's. I really wish there were a way we could help them. Um, man, everyone has it really tough, but we'll talk about personal stuff later on. Um, I just hope things get better. And that's the possible energy crisis that we have right now. Um, it's not guaranteed. Once again, we could end up getting energy from somewhere else. Uh, our own energy crisis might get better, but um, you know, that's what the situation looks like right now. So um, up to this point, uh, I'd like to ask once again, uh, does anyone have a question that maybe I can answer for you uh, regarding the energy crisis, the Muerte Cruzada, um, the presidential candidates, the decrees, um, any questions that you might have. Um, specifics I might not be able to answer, but if it's personal opinion, of course, I'm always uh, open to give you my thoughts and my ideas on what's been happening. I will talk about a little bit more about what people are thinking in a bit um, after I've talked about, um, I guess you could say, the next topic, because the next topic is going to be the increase in prices. And um, then we'll go into a little bit more of, um, we'll go into Q&A and then we'll go into the, how personally what's been happening um, for me and for those who I know in this sense. Um, no questions? Questions? I'll drink some water to give time for questions. I, I swear. You got to give water with lemon and, and salt to try. Not, it, it might not be good for everyone, like in the sense you might not like it, but it is healthy and I feel like I'd rather drink this. Um, this is like my, my cheat to when I don't want to drink just water because normally I would just drink water, but yeah. Um, okay, let's move on to some, uh, I guess, price hikes. Um, some of those things that I always say that you don't notice, I made sure to ask my dad, uh, specifically uh, what we're happening. Uh, is there inflation? There is a form of inflation that I'd like to, that I'm actually gonna talk about right now. Um, some things went up in price recently. Uh, electrolytes, yes it is. Um, it's very healthy. I just, I, I can't recommend it because I don't know if anyone, if people would like to drink, you know, water with, with lemon and salt. I realize it's like something that you would call kind of like an acquired taste or something, I don't know. Like, I, even my friends from uh, Switzerland, they're like, how can you drink this? And I'm like, oh, it's really good. <laughs> uh, I like it. Um, but it's because I'm thinking of it from the perspective of someone who doesn't drink juice, who doesn't drink cola, who only drinks water. So it just tastes better to me because it's better than just drinking water, even though there's nothing wrong with water. Uh, I remember reading that China financed a hydropower plant in Ecuador. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but that apparently doesn't make up for all the energy that we still need, is the problem. That's why we're getting some rations from Colombia. At least that's the explanation I can give it. Um, so, moving on. Uh, kind of inflation. So right now, the price of chicken has gone up. So for anyone who goes out and buys chicken per pound, 
uh, chicken has gone up from $1.90 to $2.25 per pound. Um, rice, potato, and eggs have also gone up in price. Uh, using potatoes as an example, uh, it went from $0.25 cents per pound to $0.40 cents per pound. So basically before, if you were getting four pounds of potatoes for $1, now you're getting two and a half pounds for $1, which basically you're getting half the amount of potatoes almost, uh, which is terrible. Um, in the sense that obviously if you were making food with potatoes, that sucks. Um, oil was at three, is at $3 now and it went up from $2.20, which means literally 80 cents increase. That's uh, really bad. Um, so, if you look at the basic food basket uh, for Ecuador, the price increase has gone up pretty much 18 to 20 percent. What is the problem with this? And obviously, just speaking from the perspective as someone who lives here and like, like understands what people must feel, is the fact that how do you raise the price of food, but you don't raise the price of what people are earning? I realize, obviously, every time the price that people earn is raised, which is once every year. Apparently at the beginning of the year, it always goes up by like $25. But if you raise the salary $25 and throughout the whole year, the price of things were increasing and they still keep increasing because once the salary gets raised, purposely you notice that the price of food and produce increases as well. So it's like, what was the point of increasing your salary if everything else is going up as well? And it just, it doesn't even even out because during the whole year, everything is going up in price gradually, like I've said before. It, it's just annoying and uh, it would be repetitive for me to say what I've said before. Things are going up and I'll talk about that more when I go, when we get into the personal section, but it's just annoying. Um, Fluffy, good afternoon. Hello. Buenas. <laughs> um, great looking glasses. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. This is thanks to everyone who helped me out. So. These aren't even my glasses, this is the community's glasses. I should put like a little community tab right there. Um, question, does your team need more helmets? I noticed you were all taking turns wearing few helmets. Oh, Fluffy. Fluffy, thank you very much for, for bringing this up. I was gonna talk about this later in the personal part because I don't wanna bore anyone with details, but yes, we need helmets, we need shoulder pads, we need equipment because uh, on our football team, only a few people actually have their, their gear. Like, let me show you mine, just to, just to show you. So, this is uh, my stuff. Uh, this is my helmet uh, that I bought when I actually was doing well for myself. Um, a little bit better, we'll talk more about that later on if you wanna know what I mean by that, but this is my helmet, and I bought this from a friend um, who was leaving, so he gave it to me on discount. If not, I might not even have the helmet. But at this point, it's kind of jacked up. Like, these things here, they're already broken, so I, I just had to, like, custom make some to have on my helmet. Um, and these are my shoulder pads, which I also got on a discount um, from someone else who quit the team. But it's really hard for people to get like their, their gear here. So most of the time, if you noticed in the game, we all had shoulder pads and helmets, obviously, but because we had to borrow them from teams around the country. And it's kind of uncomfortable wearing someone else's things and having to obviously maybe mess it up. But um, it's what we have to do. It's what we've had to do during this whole time that we've had football here. I was actually wondering, and this is something that I talked about with uh, Mark Horning, and I'll probably talk more about this later on because I want to talk about Mark in a bit, but um, if there was a way to get a college from the States um, or a high school, I don't know if high schools do it too, to donate old gear to, to us here in Ecuador, not just to our team because there's various teams here, and I'm pretty sure football would be more of a thing if more people had more gear. Like, it's hard for you to like get someone new to join the team if you can't promise them, oh, you're gonna have gear. They might feel unsafe and it's just, it's, it's a weird thing. But yes, uh, so the answer to that question, Fluffy, is that 
we don't have enough helmets, uh, we don't have enough shoulder pads. We're lucky to have cleats because we a lot of people play soccer, so they just play with their soccer cleats. Um, the shirts, like some of us who have been on the team for a while, we already bought our uniform a long time ago, but it's not like we update our uniform. We just have the same uniform we've had the whole time, so if it gets ripped, you just get it fixed and, and wear the same thing. But yeah, that's the situation with that. Um, let me go back into what I was talking about earlier. Uh, thank you for your question, Fluffy, and for the concern. We'll talk about American football later on. Um, so Daniel, hola Fluffy, look on the bright side, e Ecuador still has less than 3% inflation. <laughs> the typos. Um, it's all good. But yeah, uh, I do look on the bright side, to be honest, because I compare, like, this is where comparing is bad and good, because if I look at the situation in comparison to Argentina, wh whose inflation is just astronomical, we are in a much, much better position, like incredibly better. And if we look at an Ecuador in the past, where the value of sucres was very like, eh, like it's just so, so, so much better here. If you look at it like that, if you compare, but comparison is bad because I'm living in Ecuador and if I were to comp and, and I get an Ecuadorian salary. So if I compare my situation to that of Argentina, like it wouldn't be a fair comparison because someone living in Argentina, if they're doing well for themselves, they're not going to feel bad about it. So, you know, it's just one of those things, but I get what you're saying. Uh, if you were to come here with a good enough wage, like maybe you're working from outside the country or maybe you have a pension, Ecuador is going to be amazing for you. Um, Cynthia, hello. I don't know if I said hi. I, I kind of got into the inflation topic. Um, and the laws of the typo. Uh, Fluffy, how about your knees? We should find a local vendor who can equip the entire team with new equipment. It is very dangerous to play without the right equipment. You are 200% correct. Um, it's just, it's hard. We, um, we try to find sponsors, but people won't sponsor us because it's like we have, the team has to be like registered and it's hard to register with the Federation and it's hard to get registered privately. It's just a process and we haven't been able to go through it yet, but we are making plans to go through it to maybe get some sponsors, some people who want to help us out. And we don't have a problem like, you know, putting the names, putting logos on our jerseys. That's not a problem. It's just, like you said, security comes first and everything is a process. It's kind of hard to say, hey, sponsor us. Also like another problem, if we don't have a full 22 man team. And that's not even a full team. A 22 man team is just enough for offense and defense, but we don't even have that. We have 16, 17 people. So some of us are playing two positions on the field and it's really, really hard. So yeah, um, but I appreciate the concern Fluffy. If you know any way to, to help me out with this, or if anyone has any way to help me out with this, shoot me an email and uh, let me know what we can do, uh, what we have to do in order to get this done. Uh, because I'd really like to help the team out. Um, I love the team. It's not, I don't own the team, but I've been on the team for like forever. So, you know, uh, WTC, uh, is there a minimum wage in Ecuador? Yes, there is. The minimum wage for Ecuador right now is $450. Um, what's differential between hourly employees and salaried? Okay. Um, so this is, this is, we're going to jump right now. We're going to jump into a Q and A and Q and A will be kind of mixed with my personal situation because this question does kind of touch into what I'm going, in, what I'm going through right now. Okay. So, um, minimum wage, once again, $450. Um, $450. Okay. It's not a lot. It's not a little. Um, I realize that other countries have lower minimum wages, but when you consider how much you spend, and if, if you've watched my, um, cost of living video, it's very difficult to live on a $450 salary. I have gotten the question of how people live with a, with a bit, with a, with a minimum wage here. If, if the salary 
is so low and the cost of living for a person living here naturally working here is so high. And the situation is you typically don't live through this yourself. Realize how Ecuadorian culture works. The Ecuadorian and the Latin American in general lives with their parents for a very long time. In actuality, I'm living with my parents, to be honest, so you guys, you guys know. The situation is a little bit easier for me in that sense. But Ecuadorians in general, they live with their parents. So who finances a lot of their things? Their parents. If you live with your parents, you don't have to pay for rent. I live with my parents, but I pay for rent like if I were living in a, in a place by myself. But some people don't pay for rent. They don't have to pay for food, of course. Um, there's a lot of different like factors that make it easier for that person. They don't have to pay for electricity, of course, if they're living with their parents. And leave aside the fact if they're not living with their parents. Okay, they went to live by themselves. In order to sustain a, a good lifestyle, either they, well, not even a good lifestyle, just to, to survive, they rent a place that's really cheap. Uh, they live with someone, not like, in the, not like in other countries where you're my friend, so let's live together, you pay half the rent, I pay half the rent. No, you know, you get, you get a couple, like you get married and you live with that person. So each of you, if each of you earn minimum wage, then of course you have enough money to live. Alternatively, you get two jobs, a main job and a part-time job. That's why some people start their own business. Um, they're working and they're also doing on the side. One of my friends actually has a situation like that where they work, they don't even earn the minimum wage, they earn like $250 a month, but they also do transcripts and these kinds of things and they earn a little bit extra money on the side. But this friend of mine lives in their parents' place, so they don't have to pay for rent and their situation is a little bit easier because of that. So there's, there's ifs and buts as to how people live here on minimum wage. But if you had to explain it, it's cultural and once again, food is cheap, so you could minimize your cost on food and minimize your cost on everything else, live in the tiniest place and be able to survive even with a very low wage. Um, what's the difference between hourly employees and salaried? Exactly what you would expect. Um, if you have a lot of hours, you earn good money. If you are salaried, you're always stuck to the same salary per month. And if that's the minimum wage, then you're not earning a lot. Um, hourly employees though, they earn very little, depending on what city you're in and what job you have. As a teacher, I can tell you that the minimum hourly wage for someone working at an academy or an institute as an English teacher can be from around six to seven dollars, which is nothing per hour. And if we're talking about a, a monthly wage, a salary, they're still not getting paid anything more than a minimum wage unless they're like, unless the, the academy somehow offers them a lot of money, which typically you don't see. Even in my academy where I get paid a minimum wage, uh, not a minimum wage, I get paid an hourly wage and it's really good in comparison to everyone else's from other academies, it's still not enough to get me past the minimum wage threshold. I don't even make it to minimum wage. This last month, which was a bad month because of feriados, holidays, and um, just days off in general, I made, I made less than half the minimum wage which specifically I made $200. I, I don't like going into values because I don't want anyone to feel bad for me or anything about that. It's just the reality. It's just the, the thing that I go through and letting you know, that's just how my last month was. Is every month like that? No. Some months where I have a lot of hours, where I get to, do, where I get to substitute more, where I work more, I earn more. But, you know. And, um, Obviously, we have to take into account YouTube and stuff like that, but like, like I've, I think I mentioned in the last stream, YouTube is not a big source of income. It helps, of course, but um, YouTube takes most of the money, then there's the taxes. Um, let's just say out of the 100% the that YouTube could pay me, I only get 70, maybe less. 
um, 60% of what, uh, whatever I supposedly make on YouTube. And YouTube, I think I've talked about this before, you don't earn a lot on YouTube unless you're getting a substantial amount of views on your videos. And we're talking about anywhere between 50,000 to 100,000 views per video. So, you know, it's just ifs and buts, um, things like that. Uh, let's see here. In other words, what percent of the population is salaried? I couldn't tell you what percent actually has minimum wage salaries. Um, but I do know that not a lot of places offer per hour hourly wages. So, you know, there's that. Uh, Lisa, hmm, I work at a university wondering about equipment. However, these football players are huge. Hey, we have maybe not huge football players, but we have players who would, would not complain if we had a helmet um, or uh, some shoulder pads to be able to, who knows, maybe we could exchange it with other teams who need bigger helmets and they'll give us smaller ones um, in exchange. Uh, the thing is to have it because we don't have it right now. Um, it's pretty tough. Is there an overtime law in Ecuador? If you mean, is there a wage that needs to be paid for working overtime? I want to say no, but I can't confirm no. I want to say no because a lot of people complain about that, how when, you, when you're at work, they'll make you stay more time and work more hours, like, for free. They're like, no, you have to do it because you're here, you know, help us out. But if you leave on time, they'll be mad at you for leaving on time, even though that's your schedule. Like, it's dumb. But um, I don't think there's overtime unless the place that you're working at stipulates there's overtime. Like, yes, we pay you overtime. If they don't say that, then just assume there's never overtime. Um, let me see. It would be that an individual would need two incomes on minimum wage. Yes, pretty much, Daniel. Um, that's why, uh, like I said earlier, people choose to live with someone else, you know, when they get married, obviously that helps. They keep living with their parents in order to make the cost of living a little bit easier. Um, or you just live on the, on the pure minimum of what you can be as frugal and not even frugal at this point, you're just being stingy, um, as stingy as possible. Don't spend money when you can't spend money. Um, like, I, just, just as, a, as an example, I wanted to go out and eat, like, uh, there's this place called Macacos Tacos, really good. I wanted to go eat a snack, and I was like, it's $1.75. Should I go do that? And I was like, nah, I'll save that $1.75 because I can use that for gas money later. And um, I just, like, I excused going out to eat something because I wanted to eat something because I felt like I would need that money for something else. And I know a lot of people have to do that. It's just, it's kind of sad when you live your life having to think about that. But all good things in due time. The situation will get better in my mind eventually. Um, Fluffy, Thais, I think we should find a local vendor who can measure the team and give us a consolidated discount for some advertisement. Um, Fluffy, true. Um, Excuse me for being a little bit maybe um, ignorant, but what is a consolidated discount? Um, honestly, uh, the federal minimum wage in the States is only $7.25 per hour. Ouch. That is bad. And considering how expensive things are in the States, that does not seem fair. But I'm wondering, and I don't know if Daniel, you can answer my question, just uh, I guess back and forth on questions. Um, you get paid, like someone gets paid minimum wage, um, $7.25 per hour, but do they, have to, do they have to reach a certain amount of hours? Like do, do they get guaranteed 40 hours, let's just say, uh, 40 hours uh, of, of that $7.25? Like, they're guaranteed, they're getting paid minimum wage, but they're guaranteed 40 hours. Because at least from my experience, because I work this kind of job with hourly pay, I'm not guaranteed a specific amount of hours. I just get, a, I just get some hours um, per month. Um, and I guess 
I don't even reach 40 hours, I think, but um, I get as many hours as I can. Whenever they offer me hours, I'm like, I'll take it because I need it. Um, I've even started working another job um, where I work once uh, per week giving some classes just for some extra hours uh, outside of the academy. Um, and I would love to dedicate that time to something else, but I need the money. I am not like, <laughs> I'm not in a great position right now, let's just say. Um, are there cooperatives in Ecuador, cooperative stores or buying clubs that go in together, buy in bulk and then split it? I feel like there should be. Uh, I want to, I, I can investigate that. I'm going to take a picture right now so I can investigate that later. Picture? <laughs> now my brother wants to eat macacos. Um, okay, so I'm going to investigate that. I know that there's these banks called cooperativas. I don't know if that's the same thing, but um, cooperative stores, I don't know. It'd be hard to say. The minimum wage here in New Jersey is 14, 13 an hour with overtime after 40 hours. Oh, that's awesome. 14, 13 is great. The good thing is in my job, I actually have a better, like I said, my hourly wage is, is high in comparison to everyone else's. But the problem is I don't have a lot of hours um, and that's what makes my salary really weak. Um, and it's not like I don't want them. It's just there's not hours to give. Um, there's a difference between minimum wage and a living wage. Fluffy, great idea, back at you. I worked in a co-op for years and it's a great way to save money. Cool. Uh, there's usually not guaranteed numbers of hours in the US. So yeah, okay, then that's bad. That's really, really bad. Because over here, like at least if you are earning six to seven dollars an hour, it's okay. If if you if you have a lot of hours, or if you just if you combine that with another job, which is what I try to do. But if it's not, then it's tough. In the states, even worse because everything is just so expensive. Um, Daniel, no, they are guaranteed what an employer gives. They are guaranteed times, and they have on anything over 40 weeks. Some states have a higher minimum, but most states only require the federal minimum. How can they do that? Like, this, this comes into the conversation I always have about here. Like, like, I feel like it sucks here, but like, once again, I'm living here, I understand everyone's situation, and like, looking at it from the perspective of someone living here, it's bad. But if I were living in the States, and I were earning $7 an hour, and I'm not working every, like, 40 hours a, a week or like for, or enough hours to like to compensate I would be in a terrible situation man some stay no yeah I had already read that one um, yes credit unions are under the cooperative principles and economic structure uh, a lot of things that I need to understand there uh, minimum wage and living wage, two different things. Living wage is tougher here. I can definitely imagine it is. I've seen that rents for tiny places go past almost like the thousands. Um, and with the salary that you're mentioning now, like how? I'd actually like to know how people are doing it, to be honest. Uh, fluffy, consolidated discount is giving 10% or more discount when you buy a large volume. The more you buy, the greater the discount. Also, the team gives the vendor advertisement for a period of time. Oh, there should be, I don't know if official stores would do that, but um, maybe more mom and pop sports stores might be willing to do that. I'd have to ask. I really do have to ask. I'm going to talk to the owner of the team and see if we can, we can talk to some stores and show them our record because we're not a bad team. And that's considering we have few amounts of people and not complete equipment. Uh, Robert, that's why people who work full time at places like Walmart still qualify for food stamps and other what, wow, that is really, really bad. That is one of the reasons people in the States are moving abroad. Yeah, I have seen that people wanna leave the States. Like I mentioned before on a stream, 
um, Robert Blake, another YouTuber, but he's in the, the YouTube help space, um, content creator helps. Uh, he doesn't want to stay in the States. He doesn't see a future in the States anymore. At least that's what I remember reading um, from something he had said. It's tough. Um, are you able to leverage your English to earn more money on the side? Yes. Uh, I've been, like I said, I'm, I have another job now working at uh, what they call consorcio, which is like an institute, I guess. But I only have one day and it's just two hours. Uh, but it's a little bit, it's, it's $20. So I'm not going to say no to it because um, it's better than nothing. Uh, sometimes people will ask me for private classes. And the good thing is, since I'm a good English teacher and you can ask for your value when you're a good English teacher, uh, I get $20 an hour if someone asks for me for private classes. Of course, this depends on the student because most people will try to bring you down to like $10 or $15. But my ask is $20, but I tell them, you know, it can be you and two other people or three other people and you guys can split the cost. It's still going to be $20, but it's going to be split between you guys, so it'll be better for you. Um, although the disadvantage of that is the fact that if you can't focus on one person, I always tell them there's always that problem where if I can't focus on one person, I'm not guaranteeing the individual needs, but the needs of the group, and it's different. Um, let's see here. Must go now, we'll catch up later, Ace. Thanks for answering my questions and providing such great content. Lisa, I appreciate you being here. Uh, take care and I hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Um, WTC, what about escorting people to doctor's visits, banks, lawyers, etc.? Yes, I actually recent, recently offered a similar service uh, on my channel. For anyone who watched my video about, um, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, no, not analytics content. My video about the 19 essential items. Uh, in that video, at the end, I tell everyone, if you need someone to be a tour guide, if you need someone to be a, uh, a translator, like who goes around translating things, if you're coming to Ecuador and you want someone to accompany you the first few days, maybe you want to get a feel for the area, you want to meet some people, um, and I can help you out with that. Uh, just contact me through my email, my business email, and uh, we can get in touch. We can uh, negotiate a value that f feels right for you and, and right for me, and we can work something out. Um, so yeah, that is uh, something that I'm doing and I'm willing to, to do as a side job, of course. Uh, I actually want to talk about a recent experience um, giving a tour, but we'll talk about that in a second. Let me finish answering some of these comments. Uh, for uniforms, you may need to start by getting multiple sponsors who will pool their money to buy uniforms and wear logos for their businesses. Interesting point about that. Let me, I think I showed this before, but um, let me show it again over here. Eh, microphone. Okay, I am back. I think this was the one. Nope, wrong one. I actually have my old jersey, and then there's this jersey that was given to us by the mayor. That's why we have his name on the jersey, uh, Mr. Javier Pincay. Uh, he gave us jerseys. At first, they were really terrible, which was why a lot of us were not happy about it, because he gave us a... Uh, he gave us these shirts and we were mad. Um, he gave us bad shirts. He gave us shirts that looked like soccer jerseys. They didn't look good. They were burnt. They had like wax on them. It was, we were like, why are you giving us this? Like, we accept the help, obviously, but this just looks like you're not even trying. And the reason why they gave us these jerseys was for us to vote for him in the, in the, in the campaign. So that's something that I talked about politics before. Uh, I think Daniel, I saw some, some comments, I haven't been able to reply, about lobbying. I don't know if this counts as lobbying, but basically what most political parties will do, they'll try to buy off the people. I don't know if that happens in the States, of course, 
but they do try to offer people things, groups, clubs, like, hey, we'll give you a jersey. Hey, we'll give you gear, equipment. Hey, uh, we'll give you something and vote for us though. Yeah, um, but yeah, we, we can do that. Like, I don't mind doing that. Like not voting, but like putting the logos of businesses on our jerseys because if they're gonna help us, we wanna help them, of course. Um, Robert Stewart, here in the Austin area, average rents are almost $1,500 for, for lower end apartments. I'm outside of Austin, a small town. The rents here are terrible. Fortunately, I own my own place. Thank goodness. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope the situation never gets bad for you, Robert, man. And hopefully when you come over here, you just find everything like, to your liking. I'm pretty sure anyone who comes here is going to really like it. But um, we'll talk about that later with the whole experience with uh, Mr. Mark with uh, Mark Horning. Um, first, let me check something out. Let me reply to a message from my brother. Uh, okay, so, um, so facilitator is one of your services. I, I guess that's the best way to interpret it, uh, facilitator. Uh, but basically, yeah, if there's something that you need help with, uh, I don't want to say that I can, I, I, I won't, one thing I won't promise is anything that has to do with legal documents because that's not something that's in my area of expertise. I can accompany you to places, I can translate, I can help uh, with all the things that you need um, in terms of, you know, being around and everything, but I can't guarantee if there's legal documentation that I can help. A recent experience that I did, I was able to help with was when I did my job in Quito, and I didn't mention that in the video, um, because it was a side thing and I felt like the video might become too long. Um, when I did the job in Quito, I, the person who I was working with, uh, his name is Michael, uh, he had to reschedule his flight because he wanted to leave early because the altitude sickness hit him really hard. And take this into account if you're coming to Ecuador, don't forget, I mentioned it in the 19 essential things video, but definitely consider bringing altitude medication because it can affect you and it can ruin your trip. It happened to Michael and it makes me really sad because he was gonna stay until like Friday, but he couldn't. So it was tough. What the heck is this? Okay, um, but anyways, um, but yeah, he had to reschedule his flight. So he called the, the company and when he called the English help center, they didn't answer. They kept him on hold for a very long time, but he had me. So he asked me, hey, can you help me? Uh, like you call them, talk to the Spanish help center. The Spanish help center answered quickly I talked to them, I did the whole process for him, and we got through it. So it's definitely something that I can do. If, if you need help with someone like, you know, helping you out with that, definitely, 100%, I can do those things. But once again, if it's a lot of paperwork and stuff like that, that's not, I can find someone who can help with that, but it's not my, my area of expertise. I can scout out an area for you if you're thinking of moving to a certain city, and you want me to go check it out first for you, I can go there, uh, spend some time there for you. I, don't, I think it's better if you go, obviously, but I can do a lot of things as long as, um, as, long as that's what you want me to do and if, if it's in my, my abilities. Um, let me see here. What was your experience like learning English? My experience learning English was actually easy because I lived in the United States. So I was there most of my life. Uh, so for me, English is actually my main language. For me, the experience learning Spanish was a, more of a, a difficulty because I came here to Ecuador more than 10 years ago and my Spanish was low. Like just baño, eh, buenos dias, really low. But since I was thrown into the, to the school environment, I learned Spanish through interactions with people, 
uh, classes, constantly being bombarded by Spanish. And that's what I always tell everyone when they're trying to learn English. If you want to learn a language in general, bombard yourself with that language. Surround yourself with that language. You can't expect to learn a language. This is me speaking as a teacher and from personal experience. You can't expect to learn a language if you're always surrounded by any language that's not the language you're trying to learn. Because when you're trying to reprogram your mind to speak that language, it's not going to work. Um, hold up, I just got an interesting question. Does your internet cut in and out? If, you're, if it's because of the stream, I apologize, I, I, I didn't notice. But no, right now nothing like that has happened. Um, normally it does not cut in and out. If you're talking about in a general sense, there might be one day in the whole month where there's some maintenance or something terrible happened and the internet went out, but generally not a problem here. Um, but yeah, going back to my experience learning Spanish, uh, I had to be surrounded by Spanish in order to learn it to the level where I know it now. So that is my recommendation. Oh, okay, Victor. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, let me go back to where I was at. Um, Uh, Robert, I love South America. Yeah, I remember. And I speak Spanish fairly well. Estoy muy feliz por ti, Robert. Um, I'm happy for you, Robert, for everyone, so everyone can understand it. And I'll promise to take you for all the tacos. <laughs> let's go. Let's do it. Let's go for Encebollado. If you're here in Puerto Viejo, let's go for Encebollado. You're going to love it. And I'm going to tell you why. But soon, because I have to, I have to, I have to explain something. Uh, soon, soon. So many things to talk about. I love this section where we get to interact like this, just general conversation and Q&A, because we get to talk about a lot of things. Um, uh, aside from soup, what's the best meal to have in Ecuador? Uh, you can check out my, my video where I, with, with the girls, we talked about the best foods in Manabí. If I had to give you my personal opinion, I say encebollado is the best video, the best of a video, the best food in Ecuador. But everyone has preferences. Encebollado is a soup-based dish, so uh, it might not be for everyone. Uh, some other good foods here. I went to Quito and I really loved the hornado de chancho. It was a great dish. Um, there's also, what's another good dish that's not soup based? If you like, uh, if you like seafood, the platos marineros in general are really, really good. Um, in general, because anything that is called marinero means it has a lot of seafood. It is a seafood dish with a lot of different types of seafood. Um, what's another good dish that I really like? If we're talking about specific little snacks, I like pan de almidón. Bolón is a really good food. I'm going to write here bolón is really good food. I prefer bolón de chicharrón. That's my favorite um, out of the two because there's bolón de chicharrón and bolón de queso. So cheese and pork rind bolón. And I like the pork rind one more. Um, but yeah, those are just some recommendations on dishes. Definitely check out the video I just sent in the, in the, in the chat. Salchipapas. You know, Robert, you know. Um, no, the stream is perfect. Good. Would it be good? I love it. Uh, would it be good to learn Spanish before moving or is there an Ecuadorian Spanish? There is an Ecuadorian Spanish kind of in the sense that you have coastal Spanish and you have uh, Spanish from La Sierra and the pronunciation is different, very much. Um, the coastal Spanish is faster, for sure, but the, the Spanish from La Sierra has some pronunciation that's kind of, I guess you could say, difficult if you're not from La Sierra. I recommend uh, practicing with someone uh, from here I was personally trying, like not trying, but I was offering Spanish in s classes in Spanish um, as another service of mine. Uh, just the only thing that I will tell you is that my specialty is English classes. 
if I teach Spanish, it's conversational Spanish. Like we can have conversations, practice vocabulary, practice certain expressions, uh, pronunciation, uh, you know, just in general to be able to improve the conversational Spanish. That is another thing that I do offer, another service. But once again, uh, we'd have to coordinate times to make it something, you know, uh, reasonable for everyone. Um, moving on. Absolutely. Robert, good. I have noticed lag on YouTube. I wonder why. Appreciate the advice. Juan, no problem. Um, Robert, I loved your video on the chocolate taste test. Oh my God, that video is amazing. If, if you have not watched the chocolate taste test video, what are you waiting for? Uh, if you haven't watched it, I recommend watching it as soon as this stream is over. I'm going to put the, the link in the chat at a way to watch it later. Um, if you would like, of course. Um, Victor, do you have Ecuadorian friends that live in Ecuador that were also born in the States? Mm, live in Ecuador that were born in the States? Yes. Uh, my friend, he is a tattoo artist. He is, he actually, we, we made a video once before. Uh, he is living here. Though, um, he's not sure if he's going to go back to the States, but he is currently living here. Um, oh my God, that reaction, yeah. It was crazy. But just goes to show, you have preferences sometimes, and preferences aren't always the reality. Even me, imagine. Uh, no spoilers. Let everyone laugh when they find out how wrong I was about some chocolates. Oh my God. I, I still can't get over it. It's so, it's so mentally frustrating, but at the same time, eye-opening. Because now I know that I should probably try more chocolate before I say this is my favorite or this is my favorite. And the same thing like I said about the cities. Quito. Like, I love Quito, but I can't say it's my favorite because I have not spent enough time in Quito. And I still have to visit other cities. Um, okay, moving on. I'm wondering when booking a flight to Ecuador, if I were to have someone do it for me from Ecuador, if the price would be less expensive. Questionable. Because there was the, the part, something interesting that happened was that a friend who was here in Puerto Viejo, he wanted to go to, I think it was to Manglarato. And, no, to Hippihapa first. And online, on a bus, it showed prices like $11, $12. But when we went to buy the ticket, it was like $2. So it's like pretty sus. I'm just, I want to say that online they give you like the extreme price just to have you prepared. But like in person, you get the actual price. Not sure. It's a weird thing. I can't confirm, but I'm going to take a picture of that question because it's a good question. Booking a flight to Ecuador, would it be cheaper from Ecuador? Mm. Okay, uh, salchipapas. What about non-seafood? If you want non-seafood, once again, I recommend uh, bolón, eh, tonga. Oh my God, the tonga. Eh, pan de almidón as a snack. Um, those are the ones that I would personally recommend. Those are non-seafood plates. Dishes. Uh, hi there. What is the best and safest way to get from Quito to Lago Agrio? Hmm. I would, I would always recommend my order of preference for forms of transportation in the country, starting from the best, which is airplane flight. If you can go from an airplane anywhere, that is the fastest. Might not be safe if you're worried about the airplane exploding, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but that is the fastest way to get anywhere and probably the most comfortable. Even if it's cheap, like economic flight, it's so nice. But from there, if we go down, a personal driver would definitely be best. Uh, then maybe a taxi. Uh, same thing as personal driver. Very safe, very quick. Um, then would be the bus. And then you could drive yourself. That would be the least safe option. Obviously, the least safe being walking, but I don't know anyone who would walk from one city to another. Um, that's pretty extreme. That is pretty much the order. Um, 
the reaction to the lint chocolate, pretty funny. Uh, oh, best regards, Paul. Um, let's see here. I found it hilarious when one of the Swiss girls voted lint with a low point after saying, oh my God, yes. You, you should have, like, that's why I had to mute the audio, but her frustration was just crazy. Like, it was, it was crazy. Even me, even for me, like, I was pretty surprised because, like, I know they love that chocolate. So I was like, I knew they were going to give it a high rating if they knew it, which one it was. So when she rated it low, I was like, I, I was so happy that I did it blindfolded because that just goes to show, like I said earlier, you have this preconception. You like this thing, but maybe you might like something else more if you give it a chance without having bias. Um, Daniel, I think the price is ba based on port of leave, maybe. Uh, Detrep, thanks. Not a problem. Glad to help. And I just saw it yesterday. It was hysterical. Uh, it was a good video. Um, I just hope more people get to watch it because a lot of YouTube is algorithm. And sometimes since, since my channel is mainly Ecuador, I know a lot of people won't give it a shot because it's not 100% Ecuador related, even though I wanted to show you guys the Pakari chocolate box. Now I can finally open it. Um, so this box, this is the live re-unboxing, even though it's already been unboxed. This box comes with these chocolates, these eight chocolates. I knew I shouldn't have tilted it. These eight chocolates, let me see here. This was the lemongrass essence. So, uh, specifically, the chocolates that they have uh, here in this box are the Andean Rose. There's the Passion Fruit, which was in the video. There's the organic chocolate with guayasa, guay, guayusa. Okay, guayusa. Uh, there's the lemongrass essence. There's the 60% cacao. There's the Cusco salt and nibs. I'm not 100% sure if it's nibs. Uh, what is nibs? Um, there's the coffee chocolate. And there's the 70% cacao raw organic chocolate. I kind of feel like we should have tried this one in the video. Because we tried the 60% one, thinking it would be better, but I don't know if the cacao chocolate, I'm not sure. At this point, uh, I want to try them all, <laughs> but soon. Uh, Blick Lingo, long time no see. I love Pakari. For me, it's 1,000 times better than Lint. You definitely, if you're here then, you definitely have to buy yourself one of these boxes because even if I were to eat all the chocolate here, which I don't think I'm going to do anytime soon, I would definitely put it like in the background just because it makes for such a cool decoration. And there's actually, if you check out the website um, in Pakari and if you go to Quito, there's these boxes of, there's the same box, but they're like super, like super nice. It's, um, what do you call it? They're like made of like leather, like a le it's like a black box. And I was like, wow, that looks so nice, but it's expensive. It is expensive. This was like $20 and the black box was like 50 or more. I can't remember how much, but it was expensive, but it was so nice. Um, resist. Uh, let's see here. Nibs is untempered chocolate. Okay, cool. Lewis, my favorite is salt and nibs. Nice. I need to try that one. I'm going to probably try it one of these days. Uh, there are no commercial flights between Quito and Lago Agrio. The person may go through, may go to Orellana though. Anything that would make the flight easier, uh, that would make the trip easier. I'm just saying that if, if there were the option, flight would definitely be my, my top recommendation. After that, uh, personal driver. After that, the taxi. After that, the bus. And after that, walking? <laughs> I don't recommend walking, but you know. Um, okay, he needs a blind taste test. I'm gonna have to do blind taste test again with, uh, with these chocolates here. See which one is the best. Only the Pakari brand chocolate. Which Pakari chocolate is the best? Uh, who knows? I might try it. Um, 
let's see. Not sure if there's any other questions. Oh, I did want to say also that uh, my, I think I had said this before, but my cousin gave me this, pepas de cacao. These are really good. So if you ever come here, try these out. They have, um, they're covered in chocolate with banana powder. These were so good. Uh, to my cousin who gave me these, thank you very much. Um, do we have any other questions? I guess I'll start talking a little bit about uh, some side things um, that I was going to mention earlier. Uh, first, I guess I'll talk about the football team and also make a mention. Let me see, where is that image? Where is that image? Where is that image? Uh, I knew I should have put it in a place that was easier to find. Dang. Okay, so just uh, as a heads up, and the football team, I will be traveling a little bit around the country. Um, not around the country, but I will be certain days I'm going to have to go for the football games. So I'm going to be in Cuenca. Uh, specifically, let me see the image. I'll be in Cuenca on the 5th of August. We'll be playing against one of the Cuenca teams over there. So it should be fun. I'm also going to be in Guayaquil and Santo Domingo on separate dates. I might post the schedule later on in my channel if everyone is interested in that, but um, we'll see. So I'll be there and um, yeah. that was with the football team. Um, I felt like there was something else I wanted to say about the football team. I guess we just need uh, it, any help, like getting us like the equipment, like even if it's just suggestions, love it because I'm not the best at this, uh, at getting, you know, stuff for the team. But, um, but yeah, that is something that if anyone has any suggestions, uh, you can email them to me or comment them here, like how Fluffy was doing earlier with Lisa. Um, are there discotecas or dance clubs in Ecuador for those who want to practice some salsa or bachata that they are learning? Uh, the discotecas are just to, to just go dance at night, you know, clubs if you will. Um, if you're looking for a place to practice, every city has some kind of dance studio, some kind of place that offers dance lessons. And even if they didn't, you could always just, once you get to know an Ecuadorian well enough, you can ask them to teach you. Um, Every Ecuadorian, every Latin American <laughs> knows how to dance, so except like uh, obviously exceptions. There are people who never learned, and I get that because I don't even know how to dance. But um, there are places you can learn. Uh, yes, there are, but never ask for nightclubs. Yeah, don't ask for nightclubs because they're going to think uh, nightclubs. Have you seen dance schools? Yes, I have. Uh, I have I've seen different kinds of dance schools for ballet and I think once there was one that was teaching salsa because they, they had an exhibition in the Casa de la Cultura. I don't know where it is, but I know it exists. That is if you want to learn salsa, of course. Let's see. Um, there are no other questions. Uh, I guess I'll talk a little bit about my current situation and um, maybe my, uh, the channel, of course. Uh, what are some of the famous dance types in Ecuador? Um, I would say bachata. Uh, well, that's a style of music. Uh, I think cumbia is one that people like to dance um, salsa, of course. I wouldn't be able to give like any more responses to that. I don't know if Lewis can give some, some more because I don't dance, like I'm really bad at dancing. Um, but those are the ones that most stand out in my mind. I know my friend in Medellin can't dance, but there are a million dance studios everywhere. Yeah, for sure. Um, you just got to know how to look and know where to look. And um, 
you gotta have the desire, of course. I just don't. I'm, I'm okay with not being able to dance. I like to go out with my friends and just talk, have a bite to eat, and hang out. Um, what was gonna say, oh, uh, I wanted to talk about the current situation, uh, my channel. Um, currently, as a community, um, I did want to celebrate, congratulate us all because we are at uh, 3,200 plus subscribers. Uh, this is you guys. Honestly, we're growing little by little. I have this goal at the end of the year. Hopefully, we become a community of 10,000. Uh, that would be really cool. Um, and I'm hoping one day for the channel to have a channel sponsor. Uh, maybe some kind of, a, I would say company who would want to sponsor with a product or with a service. Um, obviously, it has to be something I believe in. If not, I'm not doing it because, you know, this wouldn't be fair. I'm, not, I'm never going to recommend to you guys something that I wouldn't do or that I wouldn't do, try, eat, anything like that because it's not fair. Um, so yeah, I would love for a sponsor just to change the whole situation for the channel. Uh, and my life, of course, because like I said earlier, the economic situation here for for me and my family isn't the best. Um, and you guys already know that. Um, I've already talked about that. But it's like, but this is going into the, the roots of what people live through. And we are people who live here. I live on an Ecuadorian salary um, and less than that, to be honest. So it is tough. Um, we do try to do things to make things better. Um, the other day, uh, I was talking to my dad too, and uh, he was telling me about the situation with the business. And like, this is how you know the economy is bad. Because at the beginning of the year, it was decent because there were political elections here in the, in the city for the mayor. But then little by little, it's been gradually getting worse because of the economy and because of the situation with crime. People don't want to go out, so if people don't go out, they don't spend money. If they don't spend money, then my dad, as a food business, doesn't make money. So the situation has gotten tough. He says there's days where like, he's opened and he's only been able to sell like 20 to $40. And some days where he's open and he's sold nothing. And it's unseen or unheard of because of the situ how the situation was before. It was a lot better. That's why... Uh, Tying into something that uh, I was going to talk about, uh, recently I, I gave a tour to someone who came here, channel member uh, Mark Horning. He's not here in the chat today, I think, but I gave him a tour of the city of Puerto Viejo and also Manta. And we, the tour service that I offer so that everyone knows is a little bit different from your generic tour service or from other tour services. Um, I'm pretty sure every tour service is different, but I like to believe that the way that we did the tour was pretty special. Uh, I'll let him give his opinion later on because he's going, I think he's going to give his review um, on the whole tour. But basically, we tried to make a tour that was um, very, I guess you could say Ecuadorian. Because one thing that we talked about a lot, me and Mark, when he was here, was the fact that when you come to Ecuador with, it, with the intention to live in Ecuador, it's really, it's a good idea to get, an, to get an idea of what life in Ecuador is like. Not just like, oh, I'm going to live separate from the city. Like, if you're not going to live with Ecuadorians and you're just going to live kind of separate and only interact with Americans, that's okay if that's what you want to do. But isn't that kind of like just living in the States but at a cheaper price and obviously a different environment? It feels kind of like you're missing out on a very key component. And it's the component where you get to talk and interact with the people who live here. And that's what we gave him in the tour. When we toured, we went with my best friend. He was the person who drove us. And he went and his girlfriend was there too. And it was me and it was Mark. We had conversations. We talked in Spanish. We uh, practiced Spanish. Uh, we showed him around. We gave him an experience. We, I gave him a tonga, like so he could try tonga, and we ate the tonga next to the beach. And it was like hanging out, like a group of friends hanging out and having a good time. And I feel like that's a very different kind of tour than what you would normally expect from most tours to be. And it wasn't just that. 
We also did a, what you call here like a tradition where you sacas el diablo. And basically that's when you have like a bottle of a drink from Ecuador and you, you have to get rid of it by using your, your like elbow or like, like you have to like, you have to like beat it. So that way you get rid of the, the possible hangover you're going to have the next day. It's a very Ecuadorian thing, apparently. And cause I don't drink, I didn't know, but my friends, they taught him that. He really loved the time he got to spend with them because he, he liked them as people as well. He tried in Cebollado and he had tried in Cebollado in Montañita, but he said it does not compare. That's why I tell everyone, if you come to Puerto Viejo, you're going to notice that the food here is next level, top notch. In Cebollado is the best dish in Puerto Viejo and Puerto Viejo makes the best in Cebollados in all of Ecuador. My opinion, but I think Mark can, can, can attest to that and say that the best in Cebollado is here. So it's just, you know, it's that we gave him in Cebollado and we also gave him a tour around this place called El Jaboncillo, which, which is an archaeological site in Ecuador. Uh, specifically, it's a part of Puerto Viejo. So let me see. I don't have the pictures on this phone of that, apparently. I have the pictures of uh, my friend. Well, my friend and his girlfriend that they took. So basically, it's not going to be that noticeable, but I do plan on making a post and a video with some of the footage that I got for the channel, a short video so that you can see the experience that we had in El Jaboncillo, which is the largest archaeological site in all of Ecuador. And it's part of Puerto Viejo. Interesting, right? So we did a lot of things. We had a lot of fun and Mark really enjoyed his time. So I appreciate Mark first for hiring me, for giving me that, that kind of trust, for confiding in me, um, and for, being, for letting me like, give him this experience that I feel is very different from what I think you would get from other experiences. And if any of that interested anyone who's here today or anyone who sees this on replay, hit me up on my email, uh, my business email, and we can talk. Uh, I'll leave it in the chat. B at gmail.com. We can talk. Um, like I said, I offer different kinds of uh, services depending on the situation. Just let me know. Uh, would love to see more collaborations with you. Don't worry about it, Robert. I'm going to definitely do more collaborations. I, I hope to visit Don again one of these days so we can collab. Uh, sorry, GM, he was doing a tour today. Don't worry about it. I just hope Mark is having the best time because he's here in Ecuador and he's got to take advantage of every second he's here. Um, I hope the emergency got solved, Louis. Either way, be careful out there. Uh, Tom, hello Tom. Hey GM, was just in Manabi last week, back in States, already have withdrawals. Manta is nice, wish I could have stayed longer. Hey, I hope you get to come back. Um, hopefully, I don't know if you got to stop by Puerto Viejo, but if you didn't, uh, now you have a purpose. You can come here and eat some encebollado. Like I said, Mark loved it. Um, and I'm pretty sure anyone who tries it and, and likes seafood is going to like it. And if not, there's so much food here that you're just gonna be like chef's kiss. So yeah, that was uh, the experience with Mark, um, with the, the tour that I gave him. Uh, reach out to me if you're interested for the tour um, and we can, we can negotiate, we can talk about it, we can discuss dates and see what possibilities there are. Um, what else did I wanna talk about? Uh, no, I think that's it. I think there isn't really much else. Oh, a friend of mine, uh, this is an unfortunate thing that happened to a friend, but she's, um, she recently gave birth and now she's, uh, she had this complication. So she's kind of, uh, in, in the hospital. So I don't want to ask for anything other than the good wishes towards her because she does support the channel. She watches the videos. Uh, she checks out the content. She's always asking me, hey, when is the new video going to come out? So I appreciate her support. She's been a friend of mine for a long time. Uh, her name is Ismenia. So to Ismenia, I really hope you're doing 
well or that you get better. Uh, either way, in the academy, we all pitched in a little bit because she's a coworker as well. So we all pitched in to try to help out a little bit. But um, I'm just hoping that uh, she gets better soon um, and that everything is fine because she just had her baby. And the last thing I would want is for something to happen to her uh, with, you know, the baby there. Um, but yeah, that is the, the situation with, with my friend. Um, with, with the city, I guess the frustrating thing that we had recently was the fact that we lost the water for like a week. That was really terrible. Um, but other than that, I think everything else is fine. Um, I could talk about crime as usual, but I don't want to go too deep into it. Just realize that it's, it exists. It's been going up. I think some, everyone heard about the situation in Manta and the situation in Montañita. But remember, these situations are gang-related crime. So it's, it's not going to be something that you're going to experience every day, but I don't want you to get overconfident. There was even a meme the other day where someone's saying, it's a very Ecuadorian thing nowadays to sit in the restaurant, in the part of the restaurant, that's less likely for you to receive a bullet. But that's the fear that people live through. And it's not everywhere. It's not guaranteed. But it is a caution that I want you to take if you come to Ecuador. Tom, I stayed in Puerto Cayo, not Puerto Viejo. Maybe next time. Hopefully. Hopefully, Tom. I really do hope so because you got to experience it. You can't, you can't imagine how good Encebollado is until you tried it. Um, at least in Puerto Viejo. So yeah, uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions, personal questions, doubts comments they'd like to make. I think I've spoken upon everything that uh, I needed to say. Um, I once again would like to thank everyone who is a channel member, uh, everyone who supported the channel, watching the videos, um, leaving a comment, leaving a like. Uh, remember, like, comment, subscribe, all of those things. I know they sound very YouTuber-ish, but they're really things that help out a channel. And I always appreciate everyone who supports uh, just taking the time to be here because I always say you can be doing something else like and you being here really means a lot to me. Um, it helps me out and I'm glad that I can help you in some way by answering questions and having this kind of conversation. Dave, what's going on? Um, I look over there because I have the computer there, the laptop. Um, that reminds me, every, everyone keeps telling me to get a new laptop to, to, to fix my editing. But honestly, I'm, I edit really well on my phone. And the other day, I dedicated eight hours on my phone to editing, and it was crazy. But it felt really good, and the video came out great. That was the chocolate video, and it came out awesome. But that was just eight hours in one day. I edited much more than that. Mark Horning! Hello! Como estas, amigo? How's it going? Uh, good to see you here. Um, we just recently, not too long ago, talked about your experience here. I'm glad uh, you made it. Um, but right now we're just like on the finishing thoughts. If anyone has any questions, um, any comments, suggestions, uh, what I will say is that I'm going to be making a, a new video soon. I'm probably the next video that I want to make. Uh, is the podcast episode because I realized that I've, it's been a while since I've made a podcast episode. Um, but aside from that main channel content, um, I'm contemplating what the next video should be. It's still uh, between one thing and the other. Um, but I will obviously, of course, uh, when it's ready, you guys will see it. Um, your editing is great. Appreciate it, Dave. David. Uh, many Americans are not guaranteed 40 hours per week. Damn, Michelle, that's... I, I, I remember I heard that earlier, and it's like, not cool. Um, Love that video. It was hilarious. It, it took a lot of work to get in, but I'm glad it came out great, and people loved it. Um, hola, Luis. Uh, excited to see it. Give me time. Just uh, need to edit, and we'll get it done. ¿Por qué no los dos? Uh, which two? Uh, we're expecting you. You'll see the mentions later. Yeah. Uh, I enjoy your videos. I find them more informative than most other videos about Ecuador and explaining life there and what to expect. 
I always try to, to be different. I know a lot of content creators say you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but I don't want to be the same as everyone else because I want, I want to give value. And in order to give value, I feel like you have to say, you have to be a little bit different. Um, and like I've said before, I don't want to, what was it called? I don't want to lock it behind the paywall because that doesn't seem fair. If you come here to YouTube for help, I'm here to help. Um, oh, you were just saying the podcast was between, oh, no, no, no. It's just, um, I don't know what to make next because unfortunately when, when I make content, in order to balance a schedule, like I can't make more than one video at a time because um, like for example, I wanted to record the podcast episode as soon as I was done recording my chocolate episode, but my phone doesn't have enough storage to hold both of those things. And I had to like, I had to delete, like recently, now that I finished the chocolate video, I have space again because I deleted all the raw footage. But in the process, I, I don't have a lot of space. That's why I'm planning um, this year to upgrade uh, my phone uh, to a phone that has more storage. That way I can record more videos and do more things. It's definitely gonna help in the content creation process because what I wanna do is when I finish editing one video and I post it, I wanna have footage ready to edit another video and post it and be able to have more consistent content. But for that, I need storage. And that's another reason why a lot of people think I need a, a laptop. But the thing is, the laptop itself wouldn't 100% solve the storage issue because if I put it all on my computer, then I'd have to edit on there or transfer it between the phone and the computer and it's just not seamless. Dave, appreciate the dono. Thank you very much. Uh, definitely gonna put that into the funds for, for getting the new editing device in the future. I'm still contemplating, like I'm thinking, I, I don't feel myself editing on, on a computer, but maybe I'll get a, um, a tablet or something to be able to edit on there because it's just easy for me to edit on my phone. It takes a long time, but every second of effort, trust me, it gives the end result that you guys see and I think, and I think uh, everyone's enjoying it to the fullest. So, you know, I'm gonna keep doing it. Um, I'm gonna keep making the best content I can. Uh, just be patient, please. Uh, wait for me because it does take time. Balancing real life and YouTube is a little bit of a, of a complication. But one day when YouTube is my real life, when it's just 100% my job, you're gonna see much more consistent content on here. Next time, would like to grab an Encebollado with you. Tom, it is a plan. It has to happen. We definitely have to go get that Encebollado. Encebollado. So I don't know if anyone uh, has any questions, any comments, anything they'd like to say. Um, what about the cloud? I'm not too informed on how that works. I just hear about the cloud for storage. Yes, the cloud is definitely one of the best forms of storage, but I have to play, pay a subscription plan for the cloud. And of course, you could say, it, my justification would be the cloud would be much cheaper than the phone, but the thing is the cloud is something you pay monthly or I think annually, while the phone, if I were to get the phone, like for example, the phone I have now, the one I use for my videos, that phone lasts me forever, as long as I, I can use it, of course. I have noticed that this phone has started getting a little bit slower, and I think it's because of the storage, but it's also because the years are coming by. And I know this phone, also, it won't have, this year, it's not gonna get updates anymore. Man, it is the most horrible thing. Um, that's why the next phone I get, I wanna get the 512 gigabyte model. I would go for the one terabyte, but that's almost $2,000 and it is way too expensive. Oh, I get the cloud for free. You get some storage for free on Apple as well, but I think it's only like five gigabytes or something. And every one of my videos, the video itself when it's finished, it's like two to three to four to five gigabytes. The raw footage, some of the raw footage, sometimes it's, let me see, the biggest one last time was 18 gigabytes raw footage. Then, because it's split, because I, I record it in parts, da, 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 da. So that way it's not recording everything at once. Sometimes I record as much as once as possible. But 
let me see. Uh, 18 gigabytes was the biggest one. Then there was one that was like 12, one that was like five. So it really depends on, on how much footage I recorded at the time. And obviously the quality. I always record at 4K so that when I edit it and it gets, uh, how do you call that? It gets compressed, it doesn't look ugly. Because when it compresses, like when you edit it, sometimes the quality will go down a teeny bit. Even if it's not 100% noticeable, but I want it to look good. Um, I get the cloud for free to get one terabyte. Ooh, $9.99. Mm. But that's almost a hundred dollars plus a year. At that point, like I know it's not a lot, but I, I would really, really just want to have the device and have it all there so that whenever I need it, I just have it like at that moment. It's just a preference thing. Like you get used to it, and that's what I feel like helps me more. But uh, I'm gonna save up for that for sure. Um maybe in the future I'll I'll contract some storage. But yeah, uh, I don't know if there's anything anyone else would like to say. Uh, you guys, uh, I leave the platform to you. Um, if there's anything you'd like to talk about before we leave, uh, so we can end the stream, because we're actually still pretty good on time. It's two hours, but it's, it's not three. And people, I saw people were really uh, not liking the three hour stream. I don't try to make it three hours, but sometimes it just goes on, because we like to have these conversations. So anything else anyone else would like to say? If not, uh, we'll leave it there. No comments? Okay, so uh, once again, I would like to thank all the members, uh, YouTube channel members, Mr. Daniel, thank you very much. Mark Horning, thank you very much. Lisa, thank you so much uh, for your continued support. I hope that I can keep delivering value and that I do not uh, betray your expectations. I always try to do my best. And the funds, they really just go into me making better content. This is all for me to make better videos, to make uh, more videos, to just keep doing a good job. Uh, the same thing for the members of Buy Me A Coffee, Mr. J, Raylan, William, Brian, and Candice. I appreciate your support. Once again, you guys are what makes this possible. At least until one day I have a, a sponsor or something, then that's gonna help out uh, even more. Um, and it's all just going to add up. It's all just going to help make my life here easier, the life for my parents easier, uh, the life for everyone who, who surrounds me easier because I have talked about this before, but I have plans to one day, if this becomes a job, everyone who's around me gets to like, like I can have someone help me record, someone help me go to locations to be able to do the videos, and it's just going to be so much different. The production quality is going to change once I have a crew. I have an unofficial crew, but once I have an official crew, it's gonna change. So I appreciate your support. Um, and, and I guess uh, thank, you for, thank you everyone for being here because honestly, once again, the time you take to be here, I appreciate it without a doubt. Um, Louis, take it easy. Jay, Daniel, uh, David, Tom, take care. Um, it will definitely become a job for you. Let's hope so. Uh, everyone else uh, who has commented, um, I'd have to go back. Let me say bye to everyone. Uh, Robert, appreciate you being here. To both Roberts who are here. Um, Mark Horning, of course. Uh, Michelle. Uh, let's see here. Victor Blicklingo, thank you very much. Uh, 18 Death Trap, thank you very much. Um, Juan, thank you so much. WTC, never forget. I don't know what that what the WTC stands for, but um, I'll try to remember. Fluffy for the continued support. Uh, and yeah, no, there's also Berg. Thank you very much. Don Shader, who was here for a while. Uh, Roddy, uh, who was here as well at one point. Kim, Michael. Thank you very much for being here. And yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Dave, Dave, <laughs> appreciate it again. Uh, thanks for the support. Take care, everyone. And as always, ace out. We will talk soon.